الدليل محمد الدين وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين. قلت التيمي صلى الله تعالى كتاب العلم وكتاب اهل العلم فهو صحيح الامام البخاري رحمه الله تعالى. And it's good to be like an hour in Allah Ta'ala so if you feel comfortable if you want to leave any time in Allah Ta'ala this is definitely a blessing to be sitting in the masjid reading the hadith of the Prophet Ali Sallallahu Alaihi the most authentic book after the Quran which is this book Sahih Ibn Bukhari Rahimahullah Ta'ala and as we said before it's something that has been uh, neglected by many of the Muslims today there is to sit in the masjid to read the books of Ahadith. Even if they just hear it and know the meaning, then that's it. Without uh, too much explanation. Uh, just to get to know what the Prophet said, because if you really follow every word uh, and try to extract the benefits as the ulama they uh, mentioned, we can spend so long uh, for just maybe half of a hadith or so. We'll try to be brief as much as we can, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, to get the barakah and the blessings of listening to the hadith of the Prophet والسلام, saying sallallahu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam and getting to benefit from uh, the words of the Prophet والسلام, which is again the sunnah is wahi also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says wa yantiqa'an hawa in huwa in wahi in yuha he does not speak from his desire he speaks from revelation Kitab uh, al the book of Al-Ilm, most of the chapters, as you probably heard before, it talks about the etiquettes of seeking knowledge. And as we heard, the virtues of seeking the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, and still more virtues will come in the book. Uh, this is the most valuable thing, and we have to choose to believe this way, because this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and this is what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So the most valuable thing in our life is to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. And once we know that, we have the patience to apply and to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So since this is the most valuable thing, and the content of the ilm is the wahi, is the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means we have to take the manners and the etiquettes so that we can learn it. Because many people, they might seek what is very valuable, but they never attain it. So uh, it's tawfiq and help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have to have this truthfulness and this eagerness that we really sincerely want to know the truth so that we would follow it. And the truth is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, what the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. So the tenth chapter within Kitab al-Ilm, he says, Babu al-Ilm qabla al-Qawli wal amal Either you say Babu al-Ilm qabla al-Qawli wal amal or Babu al-Ilm qabla al-Qawli wal amal Al-Ilm the knowledge. Qab before al qab wal amal before speech and action. Knowledge comes first. And this is a, a very important statement that becomes a principle in our life. Why? Because before we speak about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, matters of belief, ibadah, anything, before we do anything we have to have the knowledge. We have to know that this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. Because why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And that's why the, many people when they say, I believe this and you believe this and I think and, I, and, you, and you think in the deen of Allah, we can't do that. We have to know, know first before we will act. And that's why the, the, the warning should be in such a way, how can we get married if we don't have uh, the knowledge of uh, how to get married? We don't have to study all the rulings, but what do we do if we don't have the ruling? We go to the person of knowledge and we get married according to what he would teach us or he would do it, perform it in front of us. We don't do it on our own. Uh, and that's why, because we have to have the knowledge or to ask the people of knowledge. So knowledge has to come first before speech and action. And then he says, because of the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, فَعْلَمْ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ Know that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So la ilaha illallah itself, a person needs to know the meaning of it. If a person says it without knowing the meaning of it, he's not a Muslim. He has to know that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. And the meaning of la ilaha illallah, it means as we said, there is no one worthy of worship. Ilah, in the Arabic language, literally, the roots of it comes from Ali ya'la ilahata, right, which comes from ibadah. There's a verse in the Quran, and uh, Musa alayhi salam, when the people of Fir'aun, they said to Fir'aun, 
about Musa alayhi salam. Wa'adharaka wa'alihatak. Wa'alihatak, the plural of aliha, you're the, the ones that you worship. Uh, there is a, another recitation of the ayah, the Quran has seven recitations and so on. There's another recitation of the ayah as Ibn Abbas, he said, وَيَذَرَكَ وَآلِهَتَكَ right, If you know the Quran, if you see the, the difference, the ayah that we recite, وَيَذَرَكَ وَآلِهَتَكَ right? The other recitation, وَيَذَرَكَ وَإِلَهَتَكَ right? إِلَهَتَكَ here means your worship. So, إِلَه, right? It does not mean God, the Creator, this and that, right? Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Creator, the Provider. But the literal wording, the meaning of إِلَه, and from it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala means the one to be worshipped. Why this is significant? Because if a person says, I believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator, is the only provider, is the only sustainer, is that enough? Of course it's not enough. Unless a person would believe that the only one worthy of worship, the only one that we worship, the only one that we turn to in our prayer, in our salah, in our sacrifice, in all of matters of worship, it's to none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's what the messengers they were sent, the people of Quraysh they used to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator they never believed that the idols that they worshipped these images of these righteous people they never believed that these images of these idols uh, are creators, they create or they provide, never they only took them as intercessors between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Quran stated, they said we do not worship them except for them to get us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the Quran stated that whenever they are in dire need, they forget about the idols and they turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So, uh, the knowledge of the meaning of la ilaha illallah, this is very essential. This is the first pillar of Islam. So it means the only one that is worthy of worship, the only one that we worship, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Of course, before that, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only creator, the provider, and so on and so forth, with his names and attributes. So if any ibadah is being done to other than Allah, somebody made sujood to other than Allah, that negates la ilaha illallah. If a person makes slaughter to other than Allah, that negates la ilaha illallah. If a person do any form of worship, dua and so on, then he says, فَبَدَأَ بِالْعِلْ Imam Khair Allah, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started with al-ilm, fa'lam. Know that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. So he started with al-ilm before even saying la ilaha illallah and acting accordingly. And you can continue to say, وَأَنَّ الْعُلَمَاءَ هُمْ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَةِ That the ulama are the inheritors of uh, the prophets. Al-ulama وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَةِ uh, As he says, وَرَثُ الْعِلْمِ وَرَثُ الْعِلْمِ meaning the prophets, they passed after them al-ilm or warithu al-ilm meaning the ulama they inherited what not money but they inherited al-ilm which is not and all of this and every statement is a part or a hadith from the prophet والسلام, not as I said we narrated in the book but it's an authentic hadith in other books and so on so the prophet وسلم, he's the one that said that the, the ulama the people of knowledge are the inheritors of the prophet inherited what inherited this ilm so it's a chain from one generation to the other, they got the ilm and the knowledge from the Prophet وسلم, and they pass it to those who are after them. That's why the ulama, they, has this, they have this great virtue when they inherit from the Prophet وسلم, العلم, and as we said before, ilm is not information, is the knowledge and acting according to this knowledge, of course. Warrathu uh, al-ilm, that means they pass and they inherited this ilm. Man akhadahu, akhada bihafdin wa'ifah. Whoever takes it, whoever takes this ilm, you take a great fortune, a great thing. This is the most valuable thing. وَمَنْ سَلَكَ طَرِيقًا يَطْلُبُ بِهِ عِلْمًا سَهَلَ اللَّهُ لَهُ طَرِيقًا إِلَى الْجَنَّةِ Also another hadith of the Prophet that he mentioned it in the, in the title. Whoever salak, whoever takes a path of knowledge, seeking with this path knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make it easy for him, the path to Jannah. As you see, the goals of the Muslim, the way to attain this goal and the, the easiest way and the best way, is definitely to seek the knowledge of the deen so that the person does not deviate right or left, but to be steadfast on the salat al mustaqim And salaka uh, tariqan, he took any path, whether it's to attend uh, a lecture in the masjid or to uh, look up something or to ask the people of knowledge, anything to do with gaining the knowledge of the deen, this is what the hadith means. 
وقال جل ذكره الله سبحانه وتعالى سر انما يخشى الله من عباده العلماء انما ونس وهير انما every time here انما especially anywhere of course in the Quran there is many in which you say انما or انما الاعمال والنيات انما means in Arabic uh, it gives you the uh, exclusive meaning that means very indeed they are the only ones this is the only anything that is mentioned after انما that means this is exclusive انما يخشى الله the ones that will the only one that would fear Allah من عباده from his slaves العلماء the people of knowledge does that mean those who are not scholars of the deen they don't have the fear of Allah no this is what it doesn't it doesn't mean this way but it means with how much knowledge you have that means your fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be more from the moment that a person knows that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah then he has the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or he should have the fear of Allah the more he gets to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes and uh, the more he will get to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on so the ulama of course they should be the first or the most those who would fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and as you see in the how the haraka it's very important in the Allah in ibadih ulama if a person says Allah that means Allah fears or rather in the Allah that means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to be feared by the people of God. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ankabut, first verse number 43, وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَّا الْعَلِيمُ وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا الْعَقْلِ This is the verb of it. It comes from the intellect. The only ones that would have the proper understanding and comprehend matters of the deen and so on, الْعَلِيمُ Those who have knowledge. So intellect does not come with anything but knowledge. So as a result of that, if a person has the knowledge of everything but not the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he does not have the, 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 the proper intellect, right? If a person has all the worldly knowledge, he will benefit himself, benefit others, but it's only limited to this life, he does not understand the purpose of his life. So this is not the real knowledge. The real knowledge or this knowledge will be benefiting, the worldly knowledge will be benefiting if a person has the knowledge that would take him to the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because al-aql or intelligence is for those who know about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what he wants from them. Also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وَقَالُوا لَوْ كُنَّا نَسْمَعُ أَوْ نَعْقِلُ مَا كُنَّا فِي أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ In Surah Al-Mulk, verse number 10, that the disbelievers in the day of judgment would say that. وَقَالُوا and they said that if we would have heard or na'qil, if we had the intelligence, we would not be among the people of the hellfire. Not that they were uh, physically less intelligent, they had the ability to think, but they did not uh, make their decisions in this life to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and to do for what is ahead. If people believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, then worship Him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of this again is by knowledge, as the ayah before it says, وَمَا يَعْقِلُهَا إِلَى الْعَالِمُونَ So it comes with knowledge. وَقَالَ هَلْ يَسْتَوِي الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are they the same? Are they equal? Those who know and those who know not. Of course they're not the same. The people of knowledge are of course of the virtues. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam وَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَمْ مَا يُرِدِ اللَّهُ مِنْ خَيْرًا يُفَقِّهُ And he stopped there and he would mention the hadith later. Whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, يُفَقِّه He would make him have thaq, meaning understanding. The word thaq, it does not mean as we think only the matters of jurisprudence or the ahkam, the rulings of halal and haram, this is just recent where people gave this terminology. But the word fiqh, what is meant in the hadith and the Quran and the early generations of Islam is to comprehend and to understand what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. So you can use the word fiqh for purification of your soul. You can use the word fiqh for manners, for matters of belief. Right? And for matters of ahkam also. So uh, whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for, he would make him comprehend and understand the religion in the right way. And these types of hadith, the ulama, they have a statement or a principle. They say uh, the understanding of the hadith, the opposite way, is true. That means whoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't want good for, he would not make him comprehend or understand the religion the right way. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us among those who understand and comprehend it. And then also the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمُ All of these are great uh, uh, wisdom of how to take the matter serious. إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ إِنَّمَا 
exclusiveness, indeed verily no doubt. Al ilm, the knowledge is by the ta'allum. Ta'allum, the fa'ul, to do the act is to seek the knowledge. Ilm does not come by default. Does not come just before because we're 40 years old or 50 years old. That means we have to have knowledge. It doesn't work this way. We have to seek the knowledge. We have to do something to learn. If we didn't learn, that means we don't have it. So, as a result of that, since the Prophet said that, if we did not learn our aqidah, our belief, never sat down and learned it, that means most probably, more likely, that we have major problems in learning matters of belief. Because it doesn't come by just looking and, and watching and things like this. We have to learn it. The same thing when it comes to our salah, our ibadah, and so on and so forth. We have to learn so that we would apply. Alhamdulillah, it's not mandatory for every Muslim to be scholars in the deen, but the mandatory knowledge is easy by the will of Allah. But the person has to spend the time and put the effort to learn, and it comes by learning, it does not come by wishful thinking. And again, wishful thinking, because people sometimes they think of religion is what makes sense to their own personal desires. If he feels that something is good, he would relate it to religion. That's not true. Religion sometimes comes with something that you as a person you might not choose to it. You might think that it's, uh, it doesn't make sense. Of course, the religion makes the perfect sense because it's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But, but if a person, all of his environment, throughout his whole entire life, thinking in, in one way or the other, right? We are in need of the wahi. That's why the messengers, they were sent. Uh, and, and how is that basically, as we said before, there are many examples. But for example, risk matters of provisions. Uh, if a person has the degrees and the, and, the, and, and, and the knowledge of matters of the world and so on, he knows that 1 plus 1 equals 2 and everything. And if he has 100, if he gives and pays 10, that means what is left is 90. But we have from the wahi, from the knowledge that it says, that the wealth of a slave of Allah will never decrease from salah, from charity. So this contradicts his physical knowledge. There's no contradiction. Right? So this is something beyond what is physical because the one that bless the wealth, the one that will give really the everlasting pleasure of it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And whoever is obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will make ways out for him. So the salah will never make you lose in your business, for example, or in your job, or in your provisions, or so on and so forth. If you are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the means of all means of happiness in this life and hereafter with the certainty. So this is what the knowledge sometimes comes opposite to what might people think with their uh, limited intelligence. And that's why the wahi makes us see some things of the unseen. And it nev never fails whatsoever. Never fails. It's only our shortcomings and deficiencies. Still, it's a long title. وَقَالَ أَبُوْ ذَرْ رضي الله عنه لو وضعت الصمصام على هذه وأشار إلى قفاة ثم ظننت أني أنفذ كلمة سمعتها من النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قبل أن تجيزوا علي لأنفذتها. Another meaning. أبو ذرْ رضي الله عنه say if you put الصمصام what a samsama? It's the tip of the very strong and stiff sword that never bends. Right? When you put the tip of it, it might bend, right? So he's saying the very strong sword. If you put the tip of it, if you put it on my qafa, is the back of the head. If you put it there, and then he pointed it as the back of his head. Some of to and you think that I would. Uh, that I would say a word, I heard it from the Prophet before uh, and I think that I would say a word that I heard from the Prophet before you kill me, I would say that word. Means what? Concealing the knowledge that this is a crime. If he knows that at this moment that if he is about to be killed and they have, you know, he makes it very graphic like this, right, for people to get the message. That if he's right there, that means in any second he will lose his life. Uh, usually a person in that situation will be thinking of all kinds of things. He's scared, he's panicking. What am I going to do? If he's a believer, he would think, it was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive me, and so on. But he's saying, if this is my case, and I know a word I heard from the Prophet ﷺ, and I have the means to say it, I would say it before I lose my life. Which means what? It means that the ilm or the knowledge is amana, is a trust. 
that the person that has the knowledge he has to convey the message. It is not permissible for him to conceal it and to hide it. Uh, and why would a person hide it? Because of, say, for example, people won't like it. Or he would be pressured otherwise. Or the masses, they don't accept it. Because usually, again, the ilm would come sometimes with what opposes what people are doing. If people, for example, invite them, they're all drinking. And you know that this is haram. Right? And if you say something, they won't like you. And they might, you know, even harm you. Even if you say it in a nice way and so on, they don't like your company whatsoever. So a person might feel pressure from <coughs> anything that is harm. But this is ilm, knowledge that the person has to convey. Has a, a, a reason why he said this. A man, he came to Abu Dhar and uh, he uh, said to him that, uh, I heard that they would stop you from giving fatwa or answering questions. Because he had, Abu Dhar uh, he was left alone because he had an opinion back to the Prophet ﷺ that it's not permissible for a person to save uh, wealth, just to spend it. And of course the majority of the Sahaba, they uh, were in the other opinion, that it's okay to save money, it's okay to save and so But he had this. And when someone told him this, then he, he said that I would never conceal anything uh, that I heard from the Prophet ﷺ. But of course the Prophet, the Sahaba, they are not everyone heard everything from the Prophet and that's the beauty of knowledge. That when some heard something, others they heard something else. And the, the, the religion is from the, the different statements and so on. But the point mentioned again with regards to Ilm, there is a responsibility for the people of knowledge to convey the message the way it is. The religion is not their religion, they can do whatever they want to do with it. It's not our job to compromise the deen. Uh, for people to like us, for example, no, we just convey the message. This is our deen, we're proud of it, we don't hide anything in it. And that's the beauty of the deen of Islam, nothing is hidden. There's no hidden knowledge only for the elite, for example, right? Like other ways of life, no, everybody, this is for everyone. Everybody can get to know what's in the deen of Islam. Then, uh, the last, or the, before the last statement, of Qalab Abbas, radiallahu the nephew of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he said, Kunu abbaniyina hukamaa fuqahat. He's talking to the people, be Rabbaniyeen, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered in the Qur'an. Kun uh, Rabbaniyeen, Rabbaniyeen from Rabb, Rabb is the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the owner of all things. So what does it mean to be Rabbaniyeen? If you literally translate it, you can say be a godly person, right, or something of that nature. Uh, but what it means of Rabbaniyeen is to, as Ibn Abbas and others, they said, of course, the people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that means those who are righteous and obedient and so on. But he said a specific meaning to this. The one that is Rabbani means that he teaches the matters of knowledge in a gradual way. He does not start with the end, he starts with you know, the, you know, the principles, the foundation, and he builds on it. Take the matter step after another. Why? Because this deen, this ilm, is as the Prophet said, in هذا الدين متين متين meaning very strong فأغلم فيه برفق that means go in it with gentleness do not try to go in it very fast that you try to learn everything at once and you get to apply everything at once no, take it easy on yourself take the matter step after another and that's why something someone repented to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala someone just embraced Islam you should have this advice that you should take the matter easy he should learn what is most important and then he build on this and the Iman will increase so that he is not tested with regards to the submission. That's why many people, when they look at the Muslims from far away, they say, there's no way. This is not my way, right? Why? Because they see the actions. Oh, that means I, this is haram and this is haram and I cannot do this and I cannot wear this. So they would run away. It's not that we would hide anything, but we would tell them, just if you believe in la ilaha illallah, say it, right? And be a Muslim and then take the matter gradually you will enjoy it. After some time, you will find the matter easy. And this is how human beings are, especially when it comes to matters of al uh, And one thing to know that this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a person is weak and not doing it, is totally different than someone that knows from, that's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he refused to do it. Right? Being weak, being, uh, you know, inshallah, I will do things like that, definitely that's closer to uh, being righteous than anyone else. Uh, then, hukama, wise people, fuqaha, having the comprehension and the understanding of the deen, 
And then that's what he says. وَيُقَالْ As he said, الرَّبَّانِي الَّذِي يُرَبِّ النَّاسَ بِصِغَارِ عِلْمِ قَبْلَ كِبَارِهِ The one that you will be raised the people with the small matters of the ilm before the, the big matters. The, the small matters, the things that they can understand. And then you will build on this. This is what they, this knowledge of anything. If you learn math, if they start with first graders with calculus, for example, right? They, they won't do it. They have to start with what is basics. Any, any matter of knowledge, it works this way. But then when you, when you look at the end result, you find someone had a PhD, and if he speaks with his terminology, or if a doctor talks to us with his medical terms and everything, we won't understand anything, right? But when you talk to the doctors like him, they will understand what he's saying. When he talks to the patient, it's very easy and very lenient and so on. The same thing with the people of knowledge. If we say things that people don't understand, if people say things that they don't understand, that shouldn't be the way it works. And this is again in anything of matters of it. Uh, after that, he says, this is what's in the chapter. The next chapter, he says, بَابُ مَا كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَتَخَوَّلُهُمْ بِالْمَوْعِرَةِ وَالْعِلْمِ كَيْ لَا يَنْفِرُهُ the chapter, what the Prophet ﷺ used to, يتخولهم. يتخولهم, the literal meaning of the word means, comes from someone that is taking care of something. When you take care of a building or a place or whatever. So what the Prophet ﷺ used to take care of his companions, بالمعظة. مورعظة is admonition. Right? Uh, admonition to make the heart soft. To remind people of the hereafter, the Jannah, the Hawfayah, the purpose of their life. That the Prophet ﷺ used to take care of them, used to do the mawrida uh, to the companions of the Prophet anhu, but not all the time, every day, day and night, and so on. But he would do it once in a while. And also matters of ilm, matters of knowledge, so that they do repel and run away. Human nature, uh, it's, a, it's a tough nature. We get bored quickly. So if somebody is on your head, uh, you know, reminding you of he left day and night, day and night, and so on. A person would lose the effect of it. So the Prophet ﷺ would do that once in a while. Unless a person would take the path of study. So we have to differentiate between the masses of the people, the Muslims in general, and those who want to take the path of knowledge to be full-time, basically seeking the knowledge. This is something else. But that's why in the Masajid, for example, if people would come once a week, uh, not come to the Masjid once a week, come to the session once or twice a week, session of knowledge, and they would learn the basics of the deen and they increase the knowledge this way. This is what it meant, right? If every day, two hours lectures, this can be too much for them. They would, you know, they would quit after some time. And the most beloved deeds to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the ones done in a consistent manner, even if it's little. Prophet sallallahu and there's a, a hadith here, we'll explain it more. He says, Hadathana Muhammad ibn Yusuf, قال أخبرنا سفيان عن الأعمش عن أبي وائل عن ابن مسعود رضي الله عنه الله عنه مسعود رضي الله عنه يسأل كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يتخولنا بالموعظة في الأيام كراهة السآمة عنه The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to uh, do the موعظة or the admonition for us uh, during the days meaning uh, sometimes uh, so that we don't get bored so that we don't get bored the reason why he said that because the people, the students of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, all the people at this time, they asked him to talk to them more, to teach them more. So he said this, the Prophet ﷺ used to teach them or to come to them or to remind them, right? It was said every Tuesday or so. But again, this is different than learning the matter series for a person to be a alim. A person to be a scholar in the deen, it won't work if he's only learning one session a week, right? But that means for all of us as Muslims, we should not uh, leave ourselves like this without learning the deen. Those who are seriously learning the deen to be scholars and so on, they do that every day. But those who are in the fields of profession and they're working, they have families and so on, still we should not deprive ourselves from coming for a lecture at least once or twice to learn the basics of our deen and to build on this knowledge. Uh, but not just to come for the lecture and that's it. These are People they would pray all the salawat of the Prophet ﷺ, so their iman is increasing, they're doing the acts of worship, they're asking if there's a matter that needs to be asked about, matters of marriage, matters of salah, rulings and so on, or matters of seeking knowledge and reminding themselves, then they would do that as Abdullah ibn Mas'ud And also the Prophet ﷺ, the next one says, 
قال حدثني شعبة قال حدثني أبو التياه عن أنس عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم قال يسد بشروا ويسروا يسروا ولا تعسروا وبشروا ولا تنفروا يسروا means make it easy and do not make it difficult and بشروا give the glad tidings and ولا تنفروا التنفير is when you might make somebody turn away and run away do not uh, repel people uh, and of course the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام uh, said this to his companions رضي الله عنهم and he said it in some occasions when people did something that made people uh, not comfortable uh, not that they would make something obligatory on them or stay away from haram because sometimes people would think that it's extremism to make the five day salah for example right so it doesn't mean that, that to make it easy is just to pray three salawat of the day no to do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us but to make it easy on the people, especially in the context of matter of knowledge, uh, do not burden them, right? Uh, or do not make them uh, do the option acts of worship so much of it that they would neglect the obligatory acts and so on. Do not make it difficult for them, make it easy for them. But what do we make easy and difficult? The deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in itself, the ease in it. Not that we would make it easy from our own, but the ease is in it. But if, if a person wants to make it difficult for himself, he can. He can stay the whole day inside. Well, I made this uh, like some form of a wadifa or an action to be done daily. He's making it difficult for himself. And if he doesn't, he would feel bad. So he's praying all day or praying all night or making a recitation of the Quran, staying away from halal, many things that are permissible for him, isolating himself, uh, making the matter difficult for himself. Right? Uh, the, in which a person should do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order and stay away from harm. And sometimes when things are fitted and tribulations and the hadith of the Prophet sallam, that the time will come when a person uh, the, uh, the one that holds fast to his religion is like someone holding onto a hot coal. So how can we understand this from the hadith that says take it easy and do what is easy and stay away from being extremists and difficult and so on. It means that sometimes even the obligations will become difficult. And to stay away from what is haram, it becomes difficult. So what to do? Be steadfast on uh, the obligations and stay away from what is haram, even if it's difficult. So the ease is not a goal in itself, right? The goal is to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Matters of ease, the matter becomes so easy. But matters of difficult times, still a person should be holding fast to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered us to do. Give glad tidings. When matter of matters of the religion, you need to give the good news. And do not make people repel when you make it impossible for them. When people say to others that you are a sinner or this or that, there is no way that you can make it. We make them feel, especially sometimes people when they bring stories from the early generations of Islam that it's not authentic. A person sometimes feels there is no way this is something that we cannot do, as if they were not human beings. Like a person prayed 60 rak'ah uh, in one night. The Prophet ﷺ never done these things. He prayed 11 rak'ahs only. So why 60 rak'ah? A person would, and would every two rak'ah he would do this and do that. The way of the Prophet ﷺ is the easy way. Or someone that would, uh, you know, doing so much extreme things on oneself against or go for hajj walking when he has the means not to. Uh, cold weather and he would choose to make wudu with cold water. He thinks that this is more reward. This is not the way the Prophet ﷺ said. As Aisha ﷺ she said, "ما خير النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم بين أمرين أن اختار أيسرهما ولا يكون حرام ولا يكون إثما." The Prophet ﷺ every time he's given the choice of two things, he would choose the easier one, as long as it's not a sin. If it's not a sin, you have two choices: to go to Hajj with an airplane or to go with a ship. Now, if you want to go for the ship because it's easier for you, no problem. But if you think that this is more reward, or if you go walking, it's more reward, or if you walk in the sun and you make it hajj, that's more reward, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most rich. He does not need our ibadah. Our ibadah is to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ. The goal is not to make it difficult. The goal is to make the ibadah. But if the only way that you make the ibadah, the only way available for you, is kind of difficult, and you endure patience, mashallah, this is, you will get the reward as, as, the more you make effort, the more you will get reward. You see the difference? So uh, a person should not think that the goal. Sometimes uh, 
Again, this is one of the things. What is the best deed ever? Some people think that the most rewardable deed is the deed that you have to put so much effort in and that you have to be so tired in doing. This is not true. The most virtuous deed is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us. It might be different from one to the other. But again, if, if the act of worship, the only way you do it, you have to endure so much patience, then they will look. Prophet sallallahu when he entered the masjid and he saw a rope extended between the poles, and he asked, what is this? And they said that this is to one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Whenever she's tired and is standing in the salah of the night prayer, she would lean on this rope. The Prophet ﷺ ordered for the rope to be undone. And he said, uh, or pray when you, are, when you have the energy to do it. If you feel asleep, go to sleep. Do not make it difficult for yourself. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to give you reward as long as you make it there. Right? But if you're tired, you end up making dua against yourself or because you're not aware of what you're saying. So the matter is easy, but if it's an obligation, you have to do the obligation. And that's why a person is not able to pray standing, then he prays sitting and so on. Uh, so this is the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, and he, uh, as we said, is the head of the ulama of this ummah. When Mu'adh radiallahu anhu, he would pray with the Prophet وسلم, and then he would go to his people and lead them in salah. Uh, so one time a man came to the Prophet وسلم, from the people of Mu'ad and he said to the Prophet وسلم, that he left the salah. Mu'ad was leading them salat al Isha in the first raka'ah of Surah al Baqarah. Right? This is not Taraweeh, but this is Salat al Isha. Surah al Baqarah in the first raka'ah. So the man, he did not quit the salah and leave. He started working all day, right? And he came and he said, he has to pray the salah in the masjid. So he's standing behind Mu'adhar, and Mu'adhar al-Jamu has the, the iman, and it's high, and he knows that this is virtuous. The more the salah is longer, the more rewards there is. So he's acting sincerely based on this. So when the man behind Mu'adhar al-Jamu, he could not take it anymore, he finished the salah on his own. Some people think that he left. No, that means he said Allah, but he made his own report, and then, he finished the salah on his own and made salam and left. Mu'adh when he heard this, he said about this man that he is some sort of a munafa person. A hypocrite, how can he do this? The Prophet والسلام, when he heard this from this man, he got so angry And he said to Mu'adh Mu'adh? Are you causing fitna, O Mu'adh? Right? And he said, Inna minkum munafireen. Some of you are repellent. You make people run away. And he said, what's wrong? He said to him, the Prophet said to Mu'ad, what's wrong with uh, and so on. Right? Uh, although the Prophet والسلام, in another hadith, he would say, I would start my salah and I want to make it long. But I hear the, uh, the crying of a baby, so I would make it short because of uh, what I know from the heart of the mother towards her child. It's not sure that as we make it too short and people are just up and down. And, you know, it's not of course like this. Of course with the itma'inan, with the tranquility and so on. Salat al Isha, for example, the norm of it, that it's not a long salat. Salat al-Fajr, the Prophet وسلم, used to recite 60 a, uh, around 60 a in Salat al-Fajr. So it's not like uh, we have to differentiate, and I'm sorry if we're taking this. Sometimes people, they say the Imam pray too long. But it's not really, it's not the pain that they would get. It's uh, it sometimes people get bored in the salah. Sometimes the Torah takes 15 minutes. What is 15 minutes? Nothing. But of course, if Fajr is close to people's work time, then people should be considered of this. If the masjid, sometimes back home, there's a masjid by the train station. Right? The masjid is right there. So people, they have the train. And it's 7 o'clock and Maghrib is 5 to 7. So the adhan and the people are making the salah and they see the train coming. Right? <laughs> and the Imam is taking his time and deciding. Right? This is uh, this is not good. If you have to see the situation of the people, as the Prophet وسلم, he said, the Imam he should consider and recognize who's praying behind him. Someone old, someone sick. People they have something to do, so to make it easy for them. Because otherwise, if a person comes and he gets fired, then he won't come to the masjid anymore. But does that mean that because of our work we should neglect the salah? No, the balance has to be done. So yes, we have to make our salah, we have to make it on time, but not to make it in such a way that we will make it difficult on ourselves.
still we have to do. The other extreme is when people would not make their salah because there's no chance because of their job. So they have to make the salah. They have to be patient because that's what it is. Uh, I know if, uh, if it's too long, we can, we can stop with him. It's okay, it's good. It's okay. So I think the Isha is at 9 o'clock, right? Yeah. yeah. It's Tuesday. So the change is at 9 o'clock. Uh, the chapter of those who would make for the people of knowledge uh, specific days. From the previous hadith, he repeats it again, uh, meaning that specifying certain days for the people of knowledge to teach the people. So this is from the Sunnah, from the way of the Prophet. He says, قال كان عبد الله meaning عبد الله بن مسعود يذكر الناس في كل خميس he used to remind the people every Thursday فقال له رجل a man said to him يا أبا عبد الرحمن his kunya his nickname لوددت أنك ذكرتنا كل يوم I wish that you can remind us every day قال أما إنه يمنعني من ذلك أني أكره أن أمين لكم he said what prevent me, what preventing me of this from this is that I'm afraid or I hate that I would make you bored if I would do that every day. And I I can I take care of you by basically giving it to you once in a while every Thursday. As the Prophet used to do the same for us so that we don't get Bored by having it every day, every day, every day, and so on. So this is something that they used to do, but again, they, it's not like they would only come for the salah. This is with regards to matters of mawira or reminding or admonition and so on. Different than studying to be a person of knowledge. Uh, the next chapter, باب من يريد الله من خير من فقيه بدي. The chapter of whoever Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants خير for, he would make it to فقيه. As Ibn Hajar Allah, he said, Ayyu Fahim, which means make him understand the religion. That if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good from someone, he would make him understand the religion. That means knowledge means understanding. Uh, and that's what he says, Haddathana Sa'id ibn Ufayr, Qala Haddathana ibn Wahb, Ibn Yunus, Ibn Shahab, Ibn Qala. Qala Humayd ibn Abd al-Rahman, Sami'tu Mu'awiyah Khatiban. I heard Mu'awiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, gave a khutbah, Yaqul, saying, سمعت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول I heard the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saying ما يريد الله به خيرا يفقهه في الدين وأمر الله سبحانه وتعالى wants good for you would make him comprehend or understand the deen and what does it mean to understand one of the early generations of Islam he said that one of the real problems of deviation is the understanding the knowledge is there, information is there, but why would a person deviate? He said, uh, and he was talking about the different major groups of deviants at the time, the Mu'tazila and the Khawarij and the Wafila and so on. What made them like giving the advice that he stay on my sunnah my way and the way of the right to guide Khalifa after Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhu. How they understood the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is the only way that Muslims will be united. Does that mean that they will not have any differences of opinions? Of course not. Because the Sahaba ﷺ, they had some differences of opinions in matters of fiqh and so this is a valid thing, no problem. But what they were all together on, this is what we also should be all together on, this understanding of the deen. Because the deen is talks about matters of belief, matters of worship. We're not talking about rocket science, uh, we're talking about things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to the Prophet And there are many examples of this, so we have to make sure that we understand it the right way. Even if a person has masters in the Arabic language, he still has to understand the Quran and the Sunnah the way it was understood then. When Ali ibn Hadid, radiallahu anhu, he came to the Prophet and the ayah of uh, the Surah Al-Baqarah about eating before Fajr, when it's Ramadan, when a person is fasting, eat and drink till the white thread is clear from the black thread before the Fajr. 
So we came to the Prophet وسلم, and these people they understand exactly what the Quran says in the Arabic language. He said uh, that uh, the way he understood it, that he had a white thread next to him, uh, next to him on, on the pillow, and a black thread, and he kept looking at them. Till it was clear that he can differentiate between the two, then it means this is the time for fix. The Prophet ﷺ corrected him. He said it's the, it's the blackness and the whiteness of the skies of the day. So it's in the skies and the horizon. It's the first white thread of the day. This is what the ayah means. So a person might misinterpret many things. And that's why whoever comes with his own understanding of the ayah says, See, the Quran said this. Then we ask. Did the Sahaba understood it like what you understood? Like I remember a person saying, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran did not say, uh, do not uh, sell alcohol. It says stay away from it. <laughs> right? So that means you can sell it but stay away from it. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but how the ayah they, they took this ayah, how did they understood the ayah? The ayah was very clear. I mean, actually the ayah means what also in the hadith the Prophet ﷺ forbade that. But many things like this, a person has to have the right understanding of, of how it was at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمٌ وَاللَّهُ يُعْطِ Which means, I am nothing but a qasim. Which means, I am the one that uh, would... Uh, uh, qasim means, uh, when, you, when you distribute something, when you divide something, and you distribute it, that means, he conveys what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. Allah wrote, and with matters of the booty of the world and things like this, he only gives, he only conveys what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, And this ummah will continue to be qa'imah, meaning standing, meaning on the truth. Those who are opposing them or against them, they won't harm them till the order of Allah comes. Which means the truth will stay in this ummah. This ummah won't happen to it what happened to the nations before, when they become totally deviants. They cannot go back to the truth anymore. So the truth will continue to be in this ummah. That's why this ummah, no matter how weak it gets, still it has the means and the sources of strength that definitely it will it gain its strength again. It gets weak, it does not die. Never. It would ever diminish whatsoever. It only gets weak because the truth is saved and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved this deen till the day of judgment. So uh, this is what the Prophet ﷺ said and this is what the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to the Prophet ﷺ and to the uh, One more hadith, inshaAllah ta'ala, if you have any questions and so. Uh, he says, uh, باب الارتباط في العلم والحكمة. الارتباط is to is is one way of permissible hasad or permissible envy, in which a person would want exactly the same what another person has without that person losing it. If you wish that you would have something that your brother had and he would lose it, this is envy. This is a vicious. But if you want to have what he has without him losing what he has, uh, it's called ghibta, and this is what al-ghibta means. It's only permissible not in everything, only in certain things that the Prophet mentioned. See the difference between the two cases, right? <coughs> Hasan is a major sin, and it's not about what the person feels in the first instant. This is a normal thing that when you see someone have more than you, or someone that has whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowed on him, something that you don't have, sometimes you would feel uncomfortable. This is a normal thing. But immediately you have to push that away you choose that you would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for barakah for that person. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bless him for what he has. And why? Because you know that everything is by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most wise and you would never wish that this brother would lose what he has. You would actually wish him to have more of it. Uh, but can you wish that you would have the same? Not in matters of this dunya. It is not permissible to want to have what this brother has, a nice car, so I wish I can have this, you know, uh, like the car that he has, or like the house he has, or like the money he has, and that's it. This is not permissible either. So what is permissible? If you have it, then it would strengthen your religion, 
then that's good. And this is what the meaning of the, the hadith that he mentions, as we will get it clear, inshallah ta'ala. says, حدثنا الحميدي, قال حدثنا سفيان, قال حدثنا إسماعيل وخالد, ابن أبي خالد, على غير ما حدثنا الزهري, قال سمعت قيس ابن أبي حازم, قال سمعت عبد الله بن مسعود, قال, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم, لا حسد إلا فتنتين. No hasad, meaning no permissible hasad, except in two things. And this is the hasad that it's called ghibta. These are the two exceptions. These are the two permissible means to wish to have something that a person has without him losing it. The first one, رَجُلُ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ مَالًا فَسَلَّطَهُ عَلَى هَلَكَتِهِ فِي الْحَقِّ A man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wealth, that he spent this wealth on the truth, on matters of goodness. So you would say, I wish I can have what he has to do what he's doing. You see someone generous, giving for the sake of Allah, spending his wealth for the sake of Allah, wisely giving charity and so on. So you would wish to have the same, for what reason? For you to gain this great deed, because of the reward uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised for those who give for the sake of Allah. وَرَجُلُ The second case, وَرَجُلُ أَتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْحِكْمَةِ A man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wisdom, which is knowledge, فَهُوَ يَقْتِي لِهَا يُعْلِمُ فَهُوَ يَقْتِي لِهَا meaning that he judged between people based on this knowledge and he's teaching them. So this is definitely, uh, again, one of the most valuable things whatsoever. So a person, he would wish to have the same knowledge of the knowledge of Ayah so that he can do the same, so that he can teach it to others, so that he can judge between the people with matters of the truth. This is a permissible uh, wish that a person can have and he can take the means to achieve it, but not to show off not to be superior, not for any worldly gain, but it's all for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the hereafter. So if a person sees matters of this world and a person, he is longing for it, he should push it away from himself. How? By looking at the outcome of it. The outcome of it, it doesn't matter if a person has millions or he doesn't. It's all about the outcome. If he has it and it leads him to Jannah, mashallah, this is a, a beauty, this is a great thing. But if it leads him to the hellfire, it will be a source of regret. So it doesn't matter also whether a person is rich or poor, it depends. it's all about what is the outcome of one's actions. And if a person is seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is a test from Allah. Some people think that for you to be righteous, you have to be poor. This is not the case. This is some misunderstanding that Allah knows best where that comes from. Right? A Muslim can be the most righteous, and he also have a lot of money and wealth and so on. But he's not being foolish with the wealth, he's not being forgetful of the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's fitna. More likely that a person when he has wealth and so on and fame and things of that nature that would pull him, this is one of the means to pull him away. But if he is struggling with himself to be steadfast on the deen of Allah and be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and if the whole wealth in the world he has and goes against one order of the orders of, the, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he doesn't care about this, just he cares about the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a blessing for him. And the Prophet ﷺ said, نعم المال الصالح الرجل الصالح That what a beautiful thing for a person to have wealth if he is righteous. Because he would spend it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the right way. Whether it's on himself, his family, the poor and so on. So, and the Sahaba رضي الله عنه, they had the rich and the poor. But the poor never envied the rich. And the rich never uh, greedy towards the poor. They all knew their rights that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, ordered them to do. So, an uh, اقتباط, or to uh, wish with matters of ilm, as the hadith says, this is something that a person should uh, always uh, seek in this. But then when it's time of forgetfulness, you'll find people, they look into wealth more and less when it comes to matters of knowledge. And this is what makes it a responsibility for us. That we need to value things in the right way. Uh, and not, I remember one brother one time, uh, he came and he told me, uh, I want to be like Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. Abdul Rahman ibn Awf was very wealthy, right? And he's one of the ten people that the Prophet وسلم, uh, promised Jannah, right? And he was very wealthy. Allah, Allah, the Prophet وسلم, made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for him. They said that if he would lift a stone, he would find money underneath. He was just, uh, mashallah, many uh, you know, have wealth and so on. So the, the, this brother, he said, I want to be like Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. But he said that something very bad after that. He said, not like, then he mentioned the name of another companion that was poor. This is very disrespectful, uh, respectful, of course. So the point is, 
uh, we should want to be like them in their actions. And the provision is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows on someone something, then he should know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from him and to be patient uh, in doing so. Uh, we'll stop inshallah at this point. And if you have any questions or uh, concerns, anything.